thank you for joining me again for uh, our second day in our devotional called Lord Teach Me to Love. Today we want to talk about um, looking at a different aspect of how we are to love God. Now, yesterday we talked about in our key scripture um, found in Matthew 22 or even in Mark 12, I believe, where Jesus is saying, you know, the, the greatest, the first and the greatest commandment is that we are to love the Lord God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we talked about how, how he was quoting the Shema, which is a Jewish prayer. Um, and he was specifically quoting out of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, no, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And so we correlated that and what that means. And so today we're going to dig in a little bit deeper. We left off talking about in order to love God, we have to be in a position to hear God. Because at the beginning of the Shema, at the beginning of that prayer, it says, Hear, O Israel. And we know that the word hear, we broke that down, it means to understand, to recognize, to comprehend, to listen. But the other side of that definition is you're listening with the intent to obey. You're listening with the intent to keep the word. So that's the second part of that, that, that definition is that word is jam-packed. What Moses or what God was saying to the people through Moses is that you need to listen to obey. You need to hear and obey. Now let's look at um, Matthew 15. We're going to look at an important passage of scripture where Jesus calls out the Pharisees. I have it here. I'm not going to read it. I just have it here for reference. But he calls out the Pharisees because the Pharisees tried to call out his disciples. Jesus is calling out the Pharisees for the hip, hip, hypocrisy because he's saying, oh, your disciples, they don't wash their hands and their feet when they eat. And Jesus is like, really? <laughs> you can't go there? Okay, let's go there. So he says, well, what about when you tell people that it's okay not to honor their father and mother with their gifts because they can use their gifts to honor God, which is true, but what the Pharisees was encouraging people to do was to not be uh, to not honor their mother and father, to not honor their obligation according to scripture, and to tell their parents, listen, I can't bless you or I can't take care of you because these gifts that I have, I'm giving to the church or I'm giving to the synagogue or I'm giving to God's service when in actuality they're not. So that is hip hypocritical because they're trying to find a way to work around the law. So Jesus points that out to them and says, listen, you guys are standing here accusing my disciples, but you're living in a glass house and you're throwing stones. And so he quotes Isaiah 29, 13 to bring home his point. And in that chapter, in that chapter, I'm going to actually read it because I want to really bring it out. It's Isaiah 29, 13, and it reads, Wherefore, the Lord says, the people draw near to me with their mouths, and with their lips they honor me, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear towards me is taught by the precepts of men. So what Jesus is saying to them is, listen, what you're doing is doesn't even count because it's just lip service. One translation says, your words are not loyal to me. Please listen. Your words are not loyal to me. You are saying that you're loyal to me, but you're really not. So God, remember we talked about yesterday that there's nothing that God doesn't see. There's nothing that God doesn't know. He's watching, he's evaluating, and he's weighing. So love to God is expressed through loyalty. This is really important because we as humans, we want God to be loyal to us because all we see is us. But when it's God requiring more of us, remember I said that God, that we're capable of more? When God requires more of us, 
then then it's a little different then it's oh well god you know my heart well you know what if someone did that to you what if someone repeatedly offended you and every time you confronted them about them about it they said well you know in my heart you know i didn't mean to say that maybe the first couple of times you might be like okay i get it we all make mistakes right we all make mistakes but then maybe after like the 20th time you're like, okay, wait a minute. I feel like I'm getting played here. I feel like you're lying to me because you keep saying the same thing, but I don't see, I don't see anything that reflects to me that you actually mean it, right? Now, what would you do? You would move away from that person. You wouldn't want fellowship with that person because that person is no longer credible. You can no longer trust that person. Now, we have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, and there is grace for us. Thank God for grace that we can go and we can repent and we can receive cleansing and forgiveness. But God is expecting more of us. He wants us to change. How do you change? The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind transform means that you are you're going from one state to another it's a metamorphosis you're no longer the that that old creation you are new if any man be in christ he is a new creature he's a new creation all things are passed away and behold all things are become or becoming new again going back to second corinthians three eighteen, when we behold god we are transformed or changed from glory to glory. So God expects more of us. He expects a progressive change in our behavior and in our lifestyle and in our, our actions. Now, if you go back to Matthew 15, and I'm going to flip there very quickly. He goes on to explain to them what's really going on here. So Matthew 15 Let's read 18 and 19. He says, oh, let's go up to 17. Are you not without understanding? He's talking to his disciples. Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the belly and then is cast out? We know what that means, right? We, we don't need to explain that. <laughs> Bless the Lord. But those things which come out of the mouth from the heart, that's what defiles the body. So what he's saying is that from out of the mouth comes your thoughts, thoughts of murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemous. These are the things that defile a man. These are the things that make a man impure. This is what he was trying to get to. You guys are worried about dirty hands and feet. And I'm looking at the dirtiness in your heart. And I want to deal with that. I want to put my finger on that. Because then when you speak and when you act and when you behave in love towards me, it's pure. You're loyal to me. Not perfect. You're not perfect, but you're loyal. That's what the scripture means when it says in the book of Acts that David was a man after God's own heart. Now we all know, many of us know, okay, if we went to Sunday school, David was far from perfect. He was a murderer. <laughs> He was a murderer, guys. Listen. But now we see in the book of Acts, God is saying that David is after his own heart. Wait a minute, Lord. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> What's going on here? God, because whenever God confronted David, David relented, submitted, repented, and was cleansed. And that's what God is looking for. He's looking for us to circumcise our hearts. You know, in the Old Testament, circumcision, you remove that tough flesh, right? And it was a sign. It was a mark that said, these people have been sanctified, set apart for God. Well, the Holy Spirit marks us now. He seals us with the hope of promise. We now have been sanctified and marked out by God. And so now God is saying, everything that you do comes from a sanctified heart 
or a heart that is being sanctified. I hope this is making sense to you. So let's go back to that key verse of scripture because we want to look at how a changed heart produces actions that can be measured as loyal to God. That's how we express our love to God is through our loyalty. So it says in Matthew 22 and Mark 12, you will love the Lord God with all of your heart. Your heart, that is your mind, that is reasoning, that's the seat of your will. You are to love God with your soul, with your vitality, everything that's essential to why you're here, the breath that you breathe, it all belongs to God. You are to love the Lord God with your mind and your strength, meaning your might and your substance, meaning what your might has produced. You are then take that and love God with it. God is looking for your loyalty because he's loyal to you. He's loyal to himself, <laughs> but he's also loyal to you through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. How does this happen? It happens when we understand the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It helps us to see. In Isaiah 6, a very popular passage of scripture, Isaiah had a vision. But let me give you a backdrop. This is, this is something that we don't hear a lot of people talk about. Um, but Isaiah really admired King Uzziah because for the most part, in comparison to all the other kings, King Uzziah was, was a good king. I mean, obviously, we saw at the end, his frailties got the best of him, and he ended up dying. But he was, or committing sin and dying, but he was, for the most part, a good king, and he ruled a long time. And Isaiah adored Uzziah, keyword. Isaiah had hope in Uzziah's reign and what Uzziah could bring and where he could take the people. He believed in Uzziah. He had put all his eggs in the Uzziah basket. But when Uzziah died, when the king died, the year that the king died, during his year-long period of mourning, it's interesting, then Isaiah saw the Lord. My question to you is, why couldn't he see the Lord before then? Why? Why couldn't he see him before that before that time? Then Uzziah had, excuse me, Isaiah had a vision of the Lord in all of his glory. It says here that the heavens, that the angels were singing and declaring, and that the earth shook and that there was smoke. And suddenly, Uzziah said, Whoa, I mean, excuse me, Isaiah said, Whoa. Woe is me. I am a mess. I am jacked up. I am, uh, my mouth, my lips are unclean and I'm among a people who are unclean. Woe is me. In that moment, he was overwhelmed by who God was. He was finally able to see past his, his, his dreams and his visions and his, whatever he thought. And he was able to see God for who he was. And likewise, for us, the fear of the Lord begins when we can see the Lord, the beauty of his spirit, and we're overwhelmed by his glory and all of his majesty. Then we can see our frailties. Everything is open. Everything is exposed. Nothing escapes God. And just his presence brings an awareness to us of areas that we have yet to submit or areas where we fall short. Not so that we can be condemned. Please hear me by the Spirit of God. It's because God wants more of us. He wants us to die so that we can truly live. So we need to see God. We need to hear him with the intent to obey, with the intent to carry out, with the intent to keep his word but we also need to see him for who he is. And even in our born again nature, even with the authority that we have been given by Christ, we still wrestle. We still wrestle with our frailties. 
we still wrestle with inconsistencies. But yet, when we behold God, we go from glory to glory. More of us dies or our, our, our sinful inclinations, right? So that more of God can live. When we keep beholding the Lord through his word as a mirror, we keep feeding on him. We keep meditating on him. We keep worshiping him. Then our hearts begin to break in a good way, right? So then our behaviors can change and we can obey him because we resemble more of him through the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So how do we love the Lord, our God, with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength? We love him because the fear of the Lord pushes us in that direction. Not a fear that causes us to be afraid, but a fear that brings a sense of awe, a sense of an awareness of the majesty and the greatness of God and that we dare not displease the Lord because we love him and our loyalties belong only to him. We may love a person, we may believe in a person, we may believe in, in our pastor, our political leaders. God is requiring that our loyalties are with him. So let me read you this quote I want to leave you because we're talking about how to love God. I think we need to go back to the basics. We may think that we're loving God, but until we measure what we're doing against the word, we don't really know. So let me read you this quote. It says, to develop a fear of the Lord, we must recognize God for who he is. That's a loaded statement. Who is God to you? Who is he? He is the creator. He is El Elyon, El Elohim. He is Jehovah, Yahweh. He is the maker of heaven and earth. He is the giver of life. He is the breath of life. He is the spirit of truth. When you start to magnify who God is, all of a sudden you realize how small you are, <laughs> right? Now, let me go on. Recognize God for who he is. And we have to take a glimpse by our spirit, the power, the might, the beauty and the brilliance of our Lord God Almighty. Fear begins when we see him in his full majesty as much as we can stand. I remember, uh, I'll tell you this story and I'll get off because I don't want to be on here too long. I remember when my uh, grandfather passed away, my dad's father passed away and um, we just all adored him. In a healthy way, okay, guys? We weren't worshiping him. But we loved him. We adored him. He, he was so special to us. And one of the things about my grandfather that I so admire, and I try to emulate as best as I can, um, is that he made everybody feel special. Whoever he was with. Now, he was tough. Don't get me wrong. But whoever he was with at that time, he really devoted himself to helping that person. And he made you feel really special. I think each one of his grandchildren will say that they were his favorite. Why, why can't we all, why can't all 13 of us say that? That's because he made us feel that way. He made us feel like we were his favorite when we were in his presence. That was just how he was. So he loved us all uniquely. When he passed away, I was struggling with that, with just, just kind of coming to terms with that. And I remember doing praise and worship at church. I just made up in my mind. I said, you know what, Lord, I'm just going to give myself over to you. I'm going to give myself away, like the song says, so you can use me. I'm going to give myself over to you. I'm not going to think about who's beside me. I am just going to go for broke, as they say. I'm going to pour myself out. If that means I'm snot, you know, snot is running, I don't care. I'm going to, I need to release this. And as I was doing that, suddenly I had a vision and I saw the Lord as much as I could stand. And it brought me to my knees. I, I was so undone. I actually had to excuse myself because praise and worship was over. And I was, <laughs> I was like messed up at the, at that time, our church had a chapel. So I had to go into the chapel and just 
lay out because God had, I was so undone. And I said, as much as I love my grandfather, Father, I love you more. And he's with you. So and it was like a reality. I will see him again. And I was overwhelmed by that reality. And in that moment, I found a level of comfort that up until that point, I didn't have. But I had to behold God. I had to behold him in all his glory. And that is what God is asking for us. He does not want our loyalties to be divided. He wants us. So when we love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we're loving him with everything that we have. Our loyalties are directed to him because we fear him.